So let's welcome Peter Martin, who's coordinated all of this and will be more specific about the Sutton Forest issues. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Alan. Well, you've heard a lot about uh, the issues we're facing across Australia. I thought I'd just quickly address, in brief, the issues we're facing here in the Southern Highlands. And uh, Alan's alluded to a number of them. Uh, like many other areas of Australia, we're under assault from coal seam gas exploration companies and also coal miners. And if any of you have been watching the television recently, you've heard a little uh, you've seen some stories about uh, a giant Korean steelmaking company called POSCO who has just purchased a property not too far from here down in the Southern Highlands using a front company called Aurelius Rural. Now, they tell me that that's normal practice. I say that's absolutely outrageous when there's 4,000 people in our group saying go away and the Windsor Carabee Shire Council has voted three or four times to say we don't want coal mining and we don't want coal seam gas in the Windsor Carabee Shire in the Southern Highlands. And these people think it's acceptable to hide behind front companies like Hume Coal, that's what they call themselves, we've got a, word, uh, a little slogan for that, hit the highway Hume and cockatoo coal, which is significantly owned by the Koreans. So these people are coming into their commu our communities and they're playing these games. And I'll just mention a couple of other things. When Hume Coal, Reed Posco, put in their submission to the state government to gain exploratory drilling rights, and this was under the present coalition state government, they already had the exploration lease which they purchased from Anglo-American, on Christmas Eve last year, they put in their review of environmental factors, which is a document, in, in this case, 254 pages, I think it was, which goes through all the stuff about, we did this and we did that, and we ful ful fulfilled all the legislated requirements. They actually said, we consulted with the community. And I looked at this and said, my God, where was I? They actually said, we consulted with the Southern Highlands Coal Action Group. When I met with Minister Harcher, with Prugard, who was generous enough to take us in to have a discussion, I said to Minister Harcher, but Minister Harcher, that was a lie. Who's actually reading these documents? Who's actually checking the veracity of what these companies are saying to you? Who's actually auditing what they do on the ground in the exploration process? And then he watches what they do when they get a mining license. And his response in that meeting was, Mr. Martin, I'm 22 people, technically qualified people short. We don't have enough resources to look at everything. Then I asked the same question of some senior executives in the planning department. Now, planning is responsible for the execution of an extraction license. So once the license is awarded, they've got to keep an eye on what actually goes on. Now, as you've heard from Alan and Drew and Jeremy and our other speakers, these are highly complex processes. Whether it's coal mining, you know, it's been going on for years, but you're talking about massive pieces of equipment, digging out huge chunks of coal from under the ground with all the potential impacts on aquifers and so on. Coal seam gas, which is obviously potentially highly destructive. So who's watching what's going on? The answer I got was, we have three people in the state of New South Wales watching every existing coal mining project, every existing coal seam gas project that's live, but hang on, we're going to double it. We're going to have six. So you're talking about six people across this state auditing what is going on in these highly destructive industries that can ruin our water supplies, ruin our land, ruin our communities, ruin our health and ruin our future. This is a joke. It's a sick joke. 
And we've got politicians, I hate to say it, who are happy to sit around and let that happen. And I, I support everything these other gentlemen have said. It's an absolute disgrace. And if we don't take control back of this issue from the politicians and force them to enact tight legislative frameworks around both coal mining and coal seam gas, well, we deserve what we get. The Koreans, the Japanese, the Chinese, the Europeans, the American steelmakers, whomever they are, in 30 years they'll be laughing all the way to the bank. Weren't those Australians stupid? Look at their country. It looks like a quarry. We're lucky. Ours looks beautiful. We've gone on. We're now onto renewable energy. We've transitioned through that phase. We no longer need Australia's coal. We no, no longer need large supplies of liquid national, natural gas. And that's the other thing. A lot of the coal seam gas is actually going to feed export LNG projects. That's what they don't tell you. Many of these com companies have developed very large LNG projects because there's a window in the world right now for liquefied natural gas. There's a big demand. But unless you get your project up and running quickly, highly capital intensive industries like that, and you're talking about spending 15 or $20 billion to build a three train LNG plant, highly capital intensive industries like that, the window closes very fast because someone puts a plant up in Qatar, someone does one in Indonesia, and all of a sudden you're the last cab off the rank. You've started to develop, you can't sign up the supply contracts. So you've got to join the dots. We've got to be smart about this. We've got to join the dots. The fact of the matter is, what Santos is doing and trying to do in Ganadar is put their foot on supplies of gas to feed the LNG plant in Queensland. Don't think it's not related. In Gladstone Harbour, where we've seen massive environmental damage, so what we're talking about here is a global war for resources and a global war for energy. And I, those words are not my words. I had a meeting with the chief executive of POSCO in Australia a year or so ago when we had this discussion about what they plan to do in the Southern Highlands. And I actually said to Mr Wu, Mr Wu, you should tell Anglo that you're not going to buy this lease. I can't, Mr Martin, because it's going to cost me a huge amount in penalties because we've already pre-committed to buy this lease and four others. Well, Mr Wu, it's going to cost you a lot more when you have to walk away from it in three or four years because we're going to stop you. Yay! Mr Wu's response to me, and this is really important, Mr Wu said, you've got to understand, Mr Martin, he's a very polite guy. I mean, this is a very nice guy. You've got to, he's working for this huge company and he's, his mind He's the management, he's got a role to play. The president in Korea said, go out to Australia and execute these projects. So as far as Mr. Wu is concerned, that's what he does. Mr. Martin, you've got to understand, we're at war. Now, you are, we're at war. We're at war with the Chinese. We need coking coal for our steel plant in Korea. BHP and Rio won't do business with us. The Chinese are trying to buy up the same resources we want to buy. You know, we're at war. It's a global war. So we need the resource at Sutton Forest. We need to dig that out of the ground because that's coking coal for our steel plants. It takes our captive coal, uh, coking coal capacity from 30 to 36 percent. And again, you can look that up on their financial statements. Well, Mr. Wu, how about the fact that to get that coal out of the ground, and it's very close to the surface in Sutton Forest, and right through this basin you've got a, a strip of coal, and it's not that regular, that sits tightly underneath a Hawkesbury, Hawkesbury sandstone aquifer that's about 50 metres thick, very close to the surface. All the landowners around here, as you know, depend on that underground water for their businesses and, and so on. Mr Wu, if you take the coal out, you're going to collapse the aquifer. That's not me saying that. In our group, we've got, you know, 
mining engineers who've been in the industry for 30 years. We've got a direct ex-director of Caltex who built a coal mine, one of the first in, in the Hunter Valley. We've got guys who've built seven coal mines. We've got a professor of geology. We've got hydrologists. And to a man, they will tell you that if they attempt to mine that coal in Sutton Forest, they will collapse the aquifer. They will drain the aquifer of the water. That will create a massive problem for Mr Wu because he's got a pump full of water somewhere. Where's it going to go? Who knows? But anyway, the point remains that we're fighting a war. We're fighting a war with major multinational companies and unfortunately our politicians are saying, you're welcome. And I hate to pick on Mr. Minister Harcher, but I have heard him say, we're open for business. And in fact, he gave us a little lecture about how important the Koreans were to the New South Wales economy as customers. Now, I suppose I was too polite to say, there's plenty of others out there, Minister Harcher, and we've got to start worrying about the future in 30 years, not your re-election in, you know, 30 months. I think I've used up enough time, but there's a couple of things that I, I just wanted to, to say to you, and everyone else has said it. We've got to understand that this has a huge impact on this area. Already we're seeing land values really depressed in any areas where coal seam gas exploratory drilling has started to pop up, as in you know, Joeja Road and uh, Wombi and Combs Road. Sutton Forest land value, you can't sell a property down there. Well, the only people you can sell them to if they want it are the mining companies. And they've bought one property with us under subterfuge and they're quite happy at the moment. You can't sell your property. So land values are, have been reduced to almost nothing. The other thing you don't, that the law doesn't uh, explain or people don't understand is if they come in and mine and ruin that water under those properties out there or wherever they are, do the owners get compensated for the vineyards that don't have enough water to water the vines or the thoroughbred breeders that can't, you know, uh, water their fields or lucerne growers or whatever. No, they don't. So the value of those, in a sense, the value of those properties and the diminution of land value, if you think about it, gets transferred into the pockets of the mining company. So as Alan said, they walk away with the profits, they leave the destruction of both properties and communities behind. And our governments are letting them, letting them do it. Now, call me naive, when the coalition government came into New South Wales, I had huge hope. Uh, they promised regional strategic land use plans where they truly measure the cost versus the benefits of this sort of activity and determine where it, and when it should be undertaken. They promised an aquifer interference legislation. They promised agricultural impact statements. They promised more uh, community consultation and transparency. Where are we today? Today, it's business as usual. Now, I'm willing to say the jury's still out. I know they're working on a number of these policies, but the question remains, are they going to deliver policies that truly reflect their promises before the election and give us a really robust framework to keep these destructive industries out of this area and many of the other communities around this state. And the jury is out because the miners are fighting back. In that stakeholder committee they've set up, there's a big shit fight, excuse me, going on between miners and communities about where and when and how these things should be measured. And the bureaucrats are showing a, a fair reluctance to change what they've been doing for the last 15 years. So the jury's out. Now I know Prue is going to stand up and talk about this and Prue's been a big supporter of us and no coal mining and no coal seam gas in the highlands so I won't steal her thunder but